Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word, Book of Revelation, the unveiling. The book that God, he wrote this or had it written by the scribes, John, to notify us of what would happen just before the first day of the millennium and just following the first day of the millennium. In other words, preparing you to make that stand. That's what this book is about. And John, in the fourth chapter we'll be concluding here today, was he was taken from the seven churches, only two pleasing God, make sure you're in one of those, and he was taken, a door was opened in heaven, and he was given that key. And he, he has gone in, and he's describing what he's seen there. So uh, as he peeks in, that prism of light around him that's on the throne, naturally that's your father, Emmanuel, God with us. So let's pick it up with chapter 4, verse 7, a word of wisdom from our father in Yeshua's name, and it reads, And the first beast, th th again, this is Zoe or Zone, whichever language you wish to say it in, it means living creature. They're guards around the throne. The first beast was like a lion, and the second beast was like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast, beast was like a flying eagle. Now, naturally, our people have always had standards, that's flags. A lot of people wonder, well, why do you have flags? We've always had flags. It's an identifier. Our main standard is the Lord Jesus Christ, yes. But these are positions, when Israel camped, they didn't just pile in as a mass. They camped by order, and usually, it would have made a five-pointed star, basically. And um, so, uh, and I will, we're, we're going to go to the book of Ezekiel that goes into a little more detail. But if you want to know what those faces mean, the lion, the eagle, the man, and the ox, you would go to Numbers chapter 2. Th those are symbolic of the outbranched, guarding tribes. And we'll go into it, but right now, we're going, to, we're going to go to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 1, verse 4. And let, let's look at a little bit of what he's seeing there that he's describing. And uh, Ezekiel, chapter 1, verse 4. Let's read it. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof was the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. Now, there, in the Hebrew, there's no such thing as color. They name an object and you go by what color it is. So it's real simple. Take your Strong's Concordance and check that word amber out. And you'll find, you'll find that it's highly polished bronze. In other words, it was a metal vehicle that the guards were controlling, that were uh, flying, more or less. Um, and uh, and this, this amber chamber, uh, I feel, and this is speculation, don't anybody make anything out of it, it's, it's an energy cell. And it's an energy we know nothing about. They don't burn um, uh, petrol, uh, fossil fuel like we do. It's awesome. And you know, we've had uh, experienced pilots 
that have seen them just go from zero to uh, breaking the sound barrier in one second. You know, do you know what that would do to a human body? It would crush you. But the spirit bodies seem to handle it real well. They, they are fast. Uh, some way or another, they defeat gravity where there is no crushing effect. Okay, ver verse 5 to continue. Also, out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. Here they are again. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, six, and everyone had four faces and everyone had four wings. Now here they have four. Well, in, in another place it will say six. Two of them are landing gear. And with these, they're parked. The landing gear is down. So they only see the wings. Now, when I, I want to explain something to you before we even go into this. That all Ezekiel had ever seen was an ox cart with wheels running by his side. And in a little bit, if we go that far, he's going to tell you these wheels went not by your side. They went on their side. And naturally, they, and they look not where they went. In other words, if you're riding a mule, you're going to turn his head and he's turning that way. Or even you, if you turn, you're going to look before you turn. So these are round and they just go where they want to. And I can see windows and there's people in there. And when the vehicle turns, they do too. Well, naturally, if they didn't, they'd pile out. So, so Ezekiel did a pretty good job of explaining this, where it carries through. When you realize you got to take yourself to where he is, an ox cart driver. Verse seven, and their feet were straight feet, like a calf, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkle like the color of varnished brass. They also, they were, in other words, they had the divine uh, hand of God upon it. Let's take the position of these. North is always the eagle. That's Dan. His flag was an eagle, and Dan's on the north. Then when you look to the east, and this is one of the things that enable me to translate properly the Bat Creek Stone. It was done by priests, so you got to put yourself in a priest's shoes to understand the Hebrew involved, because the resh is turned toward the east. And instead of the normal way, it would have been turned to the west. And a leaf. Resh, a leaf, is the line of the tribe of Judah, right there on the Back Creek stone. But how many are going to recognize that? They don't recognize the resh because it's pointing the wrong way. But then add scripture to that. You're always supposed to face east uh, in olden time, looking toward Jerusalem when you pray. So. Uh, and talk to the Father, and that's what the Bat Creek Stone is about, is a short prayer. But so at, to the east, you have the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and south is the man's face, and they call that Reuben. He was the firstborn. And then when you go to the west, you'll find an ox, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and that's always Ephraim. This is the way they camped at night, or wherever they went. This was the formation. They stayed well in, well in formation where they could protect themselves, and uh, they knew how to get it done. So that, that's all this is. He's talking about the house of Israel, and, um, and, and the symbology of the flags, therefore, that it represents, so that you would not be uh, misled, and each of these doing that. Uh, each of those living creatures, the Zoe and the Zone, represented the outlying tribes. They were the guard tribes, and the living creatures was the guard of the throne. And they were 
cherubs, K-R-B, uh, in the Hebrew tongue, it always means grasp, guard, um, and uh, so forth, uh, from, from cherub. Okay, next verse, please. Verse 8. And they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and they, had, and they four had their faces and their wings. So l let it be known for sure, we're not talking about grasshoppers, locusts, uh, mules, we're talking about man, representing our people, uh, uh, assisting our Heavenly Father. Verse 9, their wings were joined one to another. They, they were in formation. That's what we would call it. They turned not when they went. They went every one straight forward. In other words, they, whichever way they decided to go, they just moved that way. They had. They had no head to look and see where they were going. You see what a remarkable job this man that's only seen an ox cart is describing here, 10. As for the likeness of their faces, they, had, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side, and they, had, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side, and they four had also had the face of an eagle. And again, make a note of Numbers chapter 2, verse 10, or a little before that, and search it out for yourself, and you'll have this where the tribes are supposed to be and, and um, what is involved. Verse 11, thus were their faces and their wings were stretched outward, upward. Two wings on every one were joined one to another, and the two covered their bodies. This, would, this is, of course, these, uh, how do you describe that vehicle? That's the way he described it. It looks like highly polished bronze. And, uh, and he, he continues on then. We're going to stop there with uh, Ezekiel. But uh, a lot of people say, well, you're talking about a UFO. Uh-uh. There's nothing unidentified about this. UFO is an unidentified flying object. There's, there's nothing unidentified about this. It's right at the throne of God, and you'd better be able to recognize it. Um, if, even if the fallen angels, Nephilim, came to earth in Genesis 6 and impregnated woman, the sons of God, they had to have transportation because they were able to do that. Therefore, they had, they had mass different than ours, somewhat, yet made in the same form. Um, and uh, they would also need transportation. It's just a vehicle. It's according to who's driving it, whether it's good or whether it's bad. So uh, well to remember that. Don't ever be misled by whoever might be in a remarkable supernatural vehicle in the end times. Okay, returning then to Revelation chapter 5, we're going to pick it up with verse 8. Let's go with what is said here, okay? And the four beasts had each of them six wings. And like I told you, two of them, these are flying. Those were, land, were in the process of landing in formation. The gear was down, and there were less wings. Because they weren't really wings, they were gear. About uh, him, and they were full of eyes within, and, the re and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. For, uh, giving that prophecy, uh, this is all they're capable of doing. They are, they are made different than mankind, the creatures, though they are, have the appearance of a man, it signifies man, the whole house. But they are to protect. God couldn't trust man with the throne anymore uh, or the uh, Ark of the Covenant. And so he had his own guards. And they're full of eyes. Those eyes will come back in a moment here. We'll talk about them. Verse 9, And when 
those beasts gave glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever. And certainly he does. That's why you can always depend on him. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. His word does not change. His word is the same yesterday as it is today, and it shall be forever. He was here as Melchizedek. He was here as Manuel, Emmanuel, saying, God with us. He was here as a babe born to be crucified. Crucified, left, and came, has uh, uh, even appeared again. And uh, until the 40th day when he ascended and then we had Pentecost came along and that's when people, the Holy Spirit began to speak through people which was only an example, not of today, but of when the Antichrist comes and you're delivered up in Mark 13 where it says you're not to premeditate what you'll say, he'll do the talking. That's so simple if you just let it flow over your mind, the plan of the living God. Verse 10, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the, this throne, the throne, and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, 11, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. The reason I stress that is in the manuscripts is the our glory, the honor, and the power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Do, do you realize that God created you for his pleasure? Uh, not for somebody else's, other than that, that that you have and uh, that are worthy of friendship, but to give him pleasure. That's why, that's one of the reasons it's very dangerous for you to say, God sent a burden on me today. He doesn't send out burdens to his children. He loves them. If you say that a few times, he'll let you take the burden on yourself, though. He will overload your donkey. Cause it, it makes him angry. The, well, where's your documentation for that? Jeremiah chapter 23. Just real easy. Just read it for yourself and, and see and understand. Don't, don't mess with our Father. If you're going to talk to him, give him that glory, honor, and, and, and praise. He deserves it because he created you for his pleasure. You give him pleasure. And that's as it is with the Father and his children. And so, therefore, uh, don't hesitate to let him know that you love him because he is your true father. You have a natural father, but your true father is the living God. He created your very being. He created your soul, your intellect, and, and there you are, how precious it is. So uh, if you want his blessings, you will give him pleasure. I, I think that says a great deal more, too. A lot of people think, well, Father, uh, like I get this question from Isaiah about God creating evil. The word in the Hebrew is tumult. He will let trouble come your way, but God does not create evil. He created everything good. They're just people that make it go bad. Chapter 5, verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. Uh, seven is spiritual completeness. What is this word book? It's biblicon. It's a Bible. That's what he had in his hand was the Bible. Okay. Uh, the, your Greek is very specific on that. Biblion. Verse 2. And I, it comes from the, the word originates, its um, etymology is from the 
the bark, inner bark of a linden tree, okay? And it's where Biblion comes from, the very word, too. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Who, can, who has the opportunity and the wisdom to open the Bible and, and see the things that are uh, supposedly sealed there? Because we're going to have the seven seals in a minute. That's why it's important, uh, a little later, rather. Three, and no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book and neither to look thereon. Now, there's a lot of preachers today who would like to get you to believe that, that we still can't open it. It's meant to be sealed. And this is in part where the seed is planted that brings forth the lie about that. The, the name Revelation still overrides the unveiling. But this is talking about what's in your mind. You know, if your mind is sealed with truth, in other words, once you learn the truth, there's nobody going to take that away from you. It's the key of David. It unlocks that door. And sometimes what some people might say that have not that key is downright foolishness, making stuff up, adding to God's Word, saying there's something special in that. When there's when they can't listen to what is being said when the seals are open. Uh, verse 4, And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the Bible, neither to look thereon. That, that would be a sad day, and it was for him. 5, And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals. In other words, he has the truth and the key that opens those books. Who is the lion of the tribe of Judah? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest teacher that ever walked the earth was our father. Twelve years old in the temple among scholars of scholars, and they're asking him questions, and he's answering them. Why? They had the living word walking around in front of them. Verse 6, And I beheld them low in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain. That means crucified, so that's, that's a time sequence for you having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth unto all the earth. And that, we'll talk about these spirits a little later on, what they are. The seven eyes are God's 7,000 elect, uh, and, uh, and seven being spiritual completeness, whatever that number is. They're, they're the eyes that can see. And let me, let me take that one step further as I did yesterday. There are eyes that can see with understanding. They understand what they're reading. They understand what the book, the Bible, Biblion, is saying to them. And they absorb it like a sponge. They take in that truth and it goes into their mind. The mind is a wonderful thing at what, how much it can hold, how much it can possess. If you open your spiritual eyes and kind of keep your flesh eyes squinched a little shut sometimes in deep meditation and thought on God's Word. To meditate on God's Word, uh, it, it, the etymology of it and where it comes from to meditate is to chew the cud. He takes a clean animal. You see, if you chew the cud of the, what you hear, you see a cow has more than one stomach. She goes out, fills up with grass, and then that comes up in the cud, and she chews it when she's got more time 
to think it over, to go over and over it and over. So it is when you meditate. You're chewing the cud. You, you take that in your mind and you take that seal until God locks it in for you. And when it's locked, it's sealed. No one can take, it's not a matter of something sealed to keep you out. It's a seal to keep lies out of your head whereby you can snuff at them when you hear them. You know instantly what they are. Why? Because you've got the seal of God. In Zechariah chapter 4, you'll understand those eyes much better. And it starts in 3 where there's a plummet stone with seven pairs of eyes. And a plummet stone is, it keeps things straight and narrow. It lets gravity hang a stone on a string and keeps you right straight and narrow in what? The Word of God. And, and that's important, is to be aware and straight on with Father's Word. Okay, let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 7. And he came and took the book, the little Bible, out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. If we had continued on in Ezekiel, uh, chapter 2 and 3, they have the same little book. He says, take it and eat it. Absorb it. Verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. I don't want you to ever, I don't ever want to hear you say, God doesn't hear my prayer, prayers. They're even bottled. They're canned for a later time to make what you're asking it'll come true. And uh, ultimately, if it's in the right vein of God's truth and, and witness, um, it will happen in that way. But um, here, there, they are. God always, he's got time for you. Verse 9. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain. This lets you know he was crucified. Again, a time element. And hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And, and, and so it is that... Uh, that no one can count how many people have already overcome through the blood of the Lamb. That's why I think the generation that was deceived was saved for the end now, because they're going to be exposed to Antichrist again. They were in the first earth age. And which way will they go? That will be interesting. First, you know from talking to many of them which way already, but don't judge. Let God do the judging. 10, and thou hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And of course, that continues on even through the millennium that God's elect uh, uh, reign for a thousand year period, a millennium, teaching all that we can. That's what a priest does, he teaches. Well, I didn't know there would be teaching in the millennium. That's what it's about. Why would we have a millennium if it wasn't to serve a purpose of saving souls? Because Christ will still be with us. The full Godhead doesn't return until the last day, the great white throne judgment. And so if, as long as Christ is with us as Emmanuel, salvation is open for whomsoever will. There's, well, are you talking about a second chance? Listen, beloved, with what's being taught in a lot of places, and I'm not judging, but nevertheless, they haven't got a prayer of a chance. They're being set up. Why? What do you think Satan's going to say? I've come to gather you back into myself, and we're going away. We're going to fly. And, and, and that's what they believe. And you, I mean, it is almost impossible to get them to see the simplicity in the order of trumps and seals so that they can keep the chronological, 
chronological order of events that consummate the end of this age that's coming together. They're all over the place with it. But they're, they're set up for it. And they don't have a chance. But they will in the millennium because of the simple fact they didn't have one. Next verse, please. Verse 11. And I beheld, I, I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. How many people make it to heaven? You can't count them. They've all washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. They're saved, and they're there, and they're in good shape. That's, that's a lot of your descendants that have moved on. So we're, we're going to be talking about 144,000 in a minute. Uh, you better take this number and not be fooled. 144,000 are just witnesses, and they're not even the elect. Verse 12, saying with a loud voice, listen carefully, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive, here's the spirits of Christ, power, one, and riches, two, and wisdom, three, and strength, four, and honor, five, and glory, six, um, and blessings, seven. Those are the seven spirits. It doesn't get any better than that. Those are, those are all so good to, why? Because he has given you power over all your enemies. He blesses you with practically everything you do for him in fulfilling the carrying out of his gospel, his word, whereby this number that is uncountable in heaven uh, continues to grow. And, and that pleases him. And when you're, when you belong to a, a, a blessed ministry, you can see the growth. It isn't man that does it, this man or any other man. It's your father. And he, he is passing that seal out. The lamb has opened it. All you've got to do is look in with understanding. All right, bless your heart, you listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, and all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, please share it. We can no longer answer all questions. We'll take a handful. We now have been blessed to go into millions and millions of homes. And I thank our Father for that. We'll even be on one of the major satellite networks, and I really shouldn't mention names, but on one of them and maybe the other soon, we're going to have 24 hours on the weekend for you folks, and hopefully you'll enjoy that. It just grows and grows, and that's God's growth. And he, he is blessing for not our benefit, but for his, his children he loves. He created them for his pleasure, and many are beginning to turn to him 
and give him that pleasure. It, it is a beautiful thing when in some of the most trying times that people are going through, that many of them are turning where the real answer is. Even with the hardship that is pl and lies that are fed to them and placed upon them to, to find the real truth. It's a beautiful thing. So uh, if it, it's always good to hear from you. And we'll go to his throne now. You don't have to call in a message. Father, he, he knows what you're thinking even. When you're talking to him, you don't even have to say it out loud. Nobody can ever tell you you can't pray because you don't have to open your mouth to pray. All you have to do is think it in his name, and he hears. Let's go there. Father, around the world we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with, uh, this would be, who would this be? I've got two of them. This would be Stephanie from Florida. I have a question. I will try to make it short as I can. Forgive me if I am learning and trying to understand the order of events when the Antichrist comes. If you know the order of events that the Antichrist comes before Jesus while you are still in your flesh body, but you do not know Bible scriptures word for word, will you not get deceived when the Antichrist starts? And as long as you've got the seal in your mind, and you, you, you can count from six to seven. That's all you have to do is you're in a flesh body as, as long as the false one is here. The moment Christ appears, you're changed into a spiritual body. We all are. And, and um, so therefore, it's not going to be that big a deal to know the difference. And Satan will try every trick in the book. But the main thing he will work on, and it's sad, I get no pleasure from seeing people deceived, is the flyaway doctrine. That's what Satan's main message will be. You'll say, document that. They're wide open to it. Who do you think planted the seed? Uh, Shirley from Kansas. Please tell me where in the Bible it says that any Christian can anoint another Christian, or does it have to be a preacher? Please give scriptures so I can help my family member. What, what, what happened on the day Christ was crucified? 3 p.m. our time. What, what, what actually happened? I can tell you what happened. The high priest went into the Holy of Holies, and just as he was about ready to go in, Christ rent the veil, which was thick, of that Holy of Holies from top to bottom, and I would like to have seen his face, because God said, anyone can come in. Anyone can anoint that is a Christian. Why? Because you don't need a preacher. You don't need a priest. You need your father, and you need the son, and you need to ask in his name. The, the, all Christians should be accustomed to anointing because that's what Christ's name means, the anointed one. Alice from Connecticut. Is there any correct correlation between Revelations chapter 1 and verse 5 where it says Christ is the faithful witness, and in Revelation chapter 2, verses 13, where it says Antipas was uh, my faithful mortar. Further study of those words show both translations of the word faithful or one are the same in group. Well, naturally they are, but it's two different people. Uh, as, as I told you, when we come to Antipas, uh, Antipas means anti-father. Uh, whoever that is is not against our father. He's against the false father. He's right where the state of Satan is. 
where Satan's seat is, rather. And, and, um, and it is there that these, this, this one is against them. It is speculation. Don't read anything into this on my part. But as a student of the Word and the leading of God, I think it's Enoch. Because God took Enoch and Enoch preached against those that were taken in marriage. And when you read uh, Matthew chapter 24, in the end times they will be doing just like in the days of Noah, giving and taking in marriage to the fallen angels. And I feel that position is owed to Enoch. He deserved it, and he'll get to put the crowning jewels on it. Also, just like all, all the elders tossed their crowns at God. Why? There's only one crown. It all shapes into one crown. We only have, we only have one father. There's no crowns here on earth or shouldn't be. Um, naturally, except for the leadership of the tribes, and be that as it may. Edwin from Illinois. I was baptized at age 11, and I need to be baptized again. Also, I've seen the abomination of the desolation is spoken by Daniel the prophet. The Bible says, get thee to the holy place. Uh, uh, where is this in the Bible? It says, get thee out of the holy place. You, you know, this is what it's, it's talking about, is when this happens, you've only got enough time to get away from there. God's going to destroy it. And if you're evil, you'll go be destroyed with it. Uh, for a moment. And, but if you overcome, you, you will have that key of David and walk through. I, I cannot answer whether you need to be baptized again at 11. At 11, you should have been old enough to know what you were doing. But it is the Lord Jesus Christ you were being baptized to. Uh, there is only one baptism. It doesn't matter what church name. Unless, well, unless you're going to join a church, certain one, you have to go by their regulations. But as far as Christ is concerned, if you, it isn't the man that's doing the baptism. It's between you and the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody can take that away from you, and nobody can change it. So you don't change. You don't get baptized again every time you change religions or your baptized didn't, baptism didn't amount to anything in the beginning. Joe from Virginia, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, please explain who, the, who is him. Uh, it's one of the roles of Satan. It's, his role is Antichrist. He came in the power of Satan doing the role of Antichrist, whereby he's visible to all human beings, crying, I've come to fly you away. Let's leave all these sinners down here and you come with me. But if you have a relative that isn't saved by me, the false one, bring them to me. And this is why that brother will betray brother up to death. Death is the Satan and father the son. A brother, won't, he's not going to betray his own brother to death, but he will to a spiritual death if he's already spiritually dead himself. Cynthia from Arizona. How many archangels and are they the ones standing around the throne of uh, Almighty God? Well, some of them are, but, but there's not that many archangels. All of God's children, when they're in a spiritual body, are called angel beings. Okay? They're just, there's millions of them. So, uh, but archangels, they will never be born to woman. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Rita from Maryland. On January the 13th, 2014, a question was read on the air by Pastor Dennis Murray about God creating evil. He said God did not create evil. So I looked up it up in Isaiah 45, 7, and it says, I, from, I form a light, and I create darkness. I make peace, and I create evil. 
I, the Lord, do all these things. Well, you see, you stop short. Dennis Murray is a scholar. He took the word evil and went back to the manuscripts to see what it really says. It doesn't say evil. It says tumult. So do your homework, go a little deeper, take your Strong's Concordance, and you will see that God doesn't create evil. He creates things for his pleasure. He may correct, uh, he may cause a little trouble, especially to pull somebody. If he loves you, he's going to correct you. That can put tumult in your life a little bit. Dearest chat, okay, this would be Cynthia from Arizona. I'm, I am 65 years old and only your te and old and I enjoy your teachings. I am an, is an archangel be born of woman? I've got a lot of questions. No, there's no, archangels will never be born to woman. That's like saying that Michael who guards Satan would uh, come to earth as, as a man, not true. Uh, Donna from California, I have been, I've been a member of the chapel since 1999 and I thoroughly enjoy God's word as it is taught by you and Pastor Murray. The meat of his word has changed my life and my family and I continue to receive his blessings. My question is as follows. What does the number two mean spiritually? Father and the Son. They're the only two. Do mountains represent nations? Most, many times they do. That's, uh, God uses symbology. Is it to hide things from certain people? It's to cause you to think for yourself. And any good teacher is going to teach you to think for yourself. They're not going to try to do your thinking for you. If you were to come to them and say, well, do you really care whether I'm saved or not? Well, yeah, you care, but it's your business. No, you, you're the one that's got to make your own mind up. After that, once the teaching's done, then that's sharing the word. But the decision is always yours. Why? You're going to be judged by it. It's a pretty permanent judgment. It's forever. So you want to kind of get it right. And that's why God sends these seals with understanding whereby you don't mess up. Um, and uh, this is a, a Christian Audie from California. This would be, he must be visiting here from Australia. And uh, I would like first to say that I've been watching your program for about seven years and I've read the Bible previously and I didn't understand a lot of it. Then I started to watch Shepherd's Chapel and by the way, you teach the Bible chapter by chapter and word for word and I understand a little bit more, a whole lot more, he says. And for that, I thank you deeply. You are so very welcome. I have a question on my mind tonight that you might be able to answer me. I understand that Satan is going, being held in heaven by Michael the archangel and that God will kick him out of heaven and set him loose on earth. I have two questions. It isn't God that kicks him out. God gives the approval. Michael and his angels kick him out. Revelation chapter 12, we'll get there. How did Satan, why did Satan want to come to earth? It was getting a little crowded in heaven. And look what he's got down here. Whoa, he's got a bunch of troopers. They're called atheists. And he, he's got uh, even some of, he's got the, do you know that he uses pulpits more than he uses anything else? Well, I wish you could document that. Well, that's pretty simple. How did Satan try to tip Christ? By scripture. He's a scripture lawyer. I guarantee you he knows more scripture than most Christians do. But there's this one sad part. He always twists them just a little bit, just like he did in Matthew chapter 4, to fit himself, not somebody else. Uh, how did he escape? He, he doesn't escape. 
He's booted out. He has no choice. He's not in charge. And uh, you might say this is just the last place he's got to go. And he intends for the people of the world to support him enough to even overthrow God. That's not going to happen. One of God's elect has 10,000 angels to assist in a case like that. And then some. Uh, Michelle from Minnesota. Uh, hello, I have a question. You talk about uh, bartering. Is trading for a, um, a, 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 a loaf of bread, Tra you know, but what about a mortgage payment, electric company and so forth? These are larger payments to come up with and they probably won't be set up to do bartering. I'm interested in your an opinion. Oh, no, you don't, you know, how does Antichrist come in? You can read it in the book of Daniel in chapter 8 and chapter 11. He comes in peacefully and prosperously. In other words, a lot of bread's going to be flowing. But it's bread we don't want to touch. I'm talking about money. Okay. So, but he's, if he's overflowing with money, he's not going to pressure somebody to pay their bill. He's, going to, he's, he's coming to play Christ. I take care of people. And he's going to make it appear to the flyaway club that he's paying your bill for you. You know, that, that's kind of the customary anymore is, is um, to take our tax money and, and pay for anybody that won't work or anything else uh, and uh, get them this, that, and the other. So it's kind of the way Satan operates. Uh, uh, LaRue from Alabama. I discovered your program about a year ago and I've been watching faithfully twice a day, Monday through Friday on our local station. Uh, I have uh, touched, I've been touched through your preaching though I was raised by godly parents. I have learned more from you than, than in the previous 50 years spent in church. Thank you. And all those who, well, you know, it is sad, but all you have to do is teach the Bible there. But it seems that most people think that teaching chapter by chapter is boring. I find it vivacious, interesting, exciting to understand what our Father would have us say. Okay, thank you. My reason for writing today, my first name is that I am concerned because you have been, you have not been on the program aired this week through Thursday. Dennis Murray had just finished, featured instead. I am now watching your program and Dennis Murray is preaching. It is 5 a.m. I also watch at 5 p.m. I am worried about your health. Are you now retired? I kind of, sometimes I think about, I really don't. I will never retire. I'm, I will, I will go out with my boots on, I'll tell you for sure. But um, God won't let us retire. Our retirement is across the page. And um, <clears throat> I know I have, I was off quite some time. But you know, I've been doing this for many, many years building, trying to build this ministry for our Heavenly Father, He being gracious enough to do it. And so every once in a while you got to take a little time and get patched up a little bit. The, you know how it goes with age, when you get to a certain age, it's just patch, patch, patch. So you keep patching and keep going and let God do the healing. I am worried about, well you don't have to be. I also have checked online for answers but found none. Well, you just got it. I'm here, I'm happy, and here we go. Uh, Bob from, Flo thank you for being concerned. Bob from Florida. I have a question concerning God's elect. I am, I may have misunderstood, but I understood that you stated that God's elect does not have a free will, but a, at other times it seems that we, uh, 
that are sealed or God's elect. You're God's elect. But what I'm talking about is in Saint in Romans chapter eight verse um, twenty six. You don't even through twenty eight. You don't even know what to pray for sometimes. So he intercedes in your life. Why? Because God's elect bring to pass the scriptures. He, they put they put knowledge where knowledge should be. As the world burns, they have the fire hose. Uh, he, he says then, I foreordained you. And then he goes on to say, as we move towards verse 30, that you overcame in the first earth age. So therefore, he can mess with your life. Well, why can't he mess with one of the free will people? Because their judgment's coming. Yours has been. You'll still be judged for what you forget to repent of, but uh, their, their judgment is coming. And if God intercedes in their life, they can say, well, you did it. So therefore, he won't do it unless they ask. I'm out of time. I love you all because you enjoy God studying God's word, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. But most of all, God loves you for doing it. It gives him the pleasure he intended in the first place for you to read that letter, a letter of love that he sent to you, whereby you are blessed and blessed indeed. So how precious it is. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that? Bless God, and he will always bless you. Most important, though, listen to me good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.